Welcome to our Cranmerian readings. We're continuing with William Tyndale's preface to the Bible. This comfort shalt thou evermore find in the plain text and literal sense. Neither is there any story so homely, so rude, yea, or so vile, wherein it is not exceeding of a great comfort and which some seeing themselves great clerks say they wot not what more profit in many jests of the scripture if they be read without allegory than in the tales of robin hood say thou that they be written for our consolation and comfort that we despair not if such like happen to us we be not holier than noah though he were once drunk neither better beloved than Jacob, though his own son defiled his bed. We are not holier than Lot, though his daughters through ignorance deceived him, nor peradventure holier than his daughters. Neither are we holier than David, though he break wedlock upon the same committed abominable murder. All those men have witness of the scriptures that they pleased God and were good men, both before that those things chanced them and also after. Nevertheless, such things happen to them for our example, that we should not counterfeit their evil. But if while we fight with ourselves and forcing to walk in the law of God, yet we fail likewise, that we despair not, but come again to the laws of God and take better hold. We read since the time of Christ's death of virgins that have been brought into common stews and were defiled, and of martyrs that have been bound and whores have abused their bodies. Why, the judgments of God are bottomless such times. Things chance partly for examples, partly God through sin healeth sin. Pride can never be healed nor yet appear but through such horrible deeds. Peradventure they were of the Pope sect and rejoiced fleshly, thinking that heaven came by deeds and not by Christ, and that the outward deed justified them, made them holy and not inward spirit received by faith and the consent of the heart to the law of God. As thou readest, therefore, think that every syllable pertaineth to thine own self, and suck out of the pith of the scriptures, and arm thyself against all assaults. First, not with the strong faith, the power of God in creating all is not nothing then mark the grievous fall of adam and all of us in him through the light regarding the commandment of god in the fourth chapter god turneth him to abel and then his offering but not to cain and his offering we will continue that as we proceed now for philip hughes on preaching and worship in the english reformation in the second place, we find that there is a thorough respect for the scriptural Catholicity of the ancient church and a desire to reinstate purer order of past centuries after centuries of corruption and deterioration. It is important to realize that reformers did not view themselves as innovators, but restorers. Their aim was to reform what during the intervening generations had become deformed. In dealing with Renovatoris Modo Sumus Non Novatoris, Lancelot Andrews at the beginning of the 17th century was but defending the Church of England as it had been renewed by his predecessors. At the beginning of the 16th century, the Church had reached a state which may aptly be described in terms of Christ's denunciation of the religious situation of Judaism in his day. The commandments of God had been laid aside and replaced by commandments of men to such extent that the word of God was rendered null and void, 
to the prevalence of human traditions. These many years past, writes Cranmer, this godly and decent order of ancient fathers, that is the daily reading of scripture, have been so altered, broken, and neglected by planting in uncertain stories and legends with a multitude of responds, verses, vain repetitions, commemorations, and synodals. And commonly, when any book of the Bible was begun after three or four church chapters were read out, all the rest were unread. Holy scriptures had indeed been virtually smothered by a mass of man-made importations. Worship in the vernacular is coming up. We turn now to Margot Thompson's Thomas Cranmer. It's, it's Stevenson, I believe it is. Stephen Sykes on the baptismal. The prefatory material which, with which the rite begins contains a simple question whether the child has already been baptized, a brief declaration of the necessity of baptism, and two general intercessions for the child, the so-called flood prayer and the promise prayer. The introduction serves two ends. It achieves prior to the reading of the gospel a focusing of the congregation's attention on the child. But it does so secondly in relation to two themes of major importance. God's mercy, which of thy great mercy did save Noah and his family in the ark, and of the reception of children, receive them, O Lord, as thou hast promised. Because structure is composed not just of sequences, but of significant repetitions, it is well for us to look closely at the recurring words. Reception has already been used in the rubric at the head of the service for the purpose of baptism, the receiving of them that be newly baptized into the number of Christ's church. It is now used in each of the elements of the introductory material received into Christ's holy church, received into the ark of Christ's church. They receive remission of their sins. But its most striking use occurs in the gospel and the exhortation. Here Christ's action of taking children into his arms and blessing them is used as an analogy for baptism. Doubt not ye, therefore, but earnestly believe that he will likewise favorably receive these present infants, that he will embrace them with the arms of his mercy, that he will give unto them the blessings of eternal life, and make them partakers of his everlasting kingdom. The emotionally powerful image of a child being embraced in the arms of Jesus' mercy forms the effective heart of this liturgy. The word received significantly continues to echo, echo at regular intervals through the rest of the service. The address to the godparents at the blessing of the water and the priest's declaration of baptism and finally, the prayer of thanksgiving to receive him for thine own and by adoption. Now for Prof. McCulloch on Cranmer. We pick up here on the great preface ordered by Cranmer, uh, Harry. Unlike the translators of the authorized version 70 years later, the archbishop did not seek to flatter his king, but instead preached to what is a universal sermon on the use of the Bible. It is a sermon deliberately structured in two parts, addressing two opposed audiences, a strategy neatly summarized in Cranmer's letter to Cromwell of 14 November. And he said that he trusted that it shall both encourage many slow readers and also stay the rash judgments of them that read therein. Of his two sundry sorts of people, some there are that be too slow and need the spur, and some too quick 
who needed the bridle. For both, he opposed the witness of history initially by sketching the deep roots of vernacular Bible translation of the English National Church. That brief discussion is of itself of interest. First, it referred to the benefit, beneficial spinoff from the dissolution of the monasteries as hitherto unknown copies of Anglo-Saxon Bible translation turned up in the opening of monastic libraries. Second, it contributed, it acknowledged the contribution of the Lollards to Bible translation without provoking fury among conservative churches by actually naming those medieval and contemporary heretics. The witness of history continued beyond England's parochial experience because Cranmer characteristically summoned up two Greek fathers of the fourth century, John Chrysostom and Gregory Nazianzus, to give the burden of the two sections in his sermon, one father to courage and one father to warn. Cranmer could not bear that people should refuse the gift of the Bible, yet he understood what a dangerous book it could be. As he turned from Chrysostom's praise of Bible knowledge to Nazianzus's caution about its misuse, his own words in a link gave more eloquent expression than Henry had done to the fears which they both shared. Where is there here beneath better than fire, water, meats, drinks, metals of gold, silver, iron, and steel? Yet we see daily great harm and much mischief done by every one of these as a lack of wisdom and providence of them that suffer evil. Wherefore, I would advise you all that coming to the reading or hearing of this book, which is the word of God, the most precious jewel and most holy relic that remaineth upon earth, that ye bring with you the fear of God and that ye do it with all due reverence and use your knowledge thereof, not to vain glory or frivolous disputation, but to the honor of God, increase of virtue, and edification of yourselves and other. It, that is a classic section. Arthur Innes on Cranmer and the Reformation and in England mixing up some dates here. The project in that form was shelved in 1536 by the appearance of Coverdale's Bible and an injunction from the Vicar General that every church was to be provided with a Bible in Latin and English. Coverdale's version, however, was in many respects unsatisfactory but a new edition of Tyndale's known as Matthews, freed from some of the objectionable features, was hailed a year later with delight by Cranmer, who succeeded in getting it licensed by Cromwell. And in 1538, again, a new edition of Matthews, revised by Coverdale, supervised by Bonner with a preface by the Archbishop and Cromwell's license was published under the name of the Great Bible by reason of its actual size and ordered in 1539 to be set up in the churches. Although the Great Bible failed to give general satisfaction, no other translation was issued in Henry's reign. We'll pick that up. As we turn to Leslie Williams' emblem of faith on top, and now we turn to doctrine. He looks like a colic. God, the protector of all that trust to thee, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy. Increase and multiply upon us thy mercy, that thou, being our ruler and guide, we may pass through things temporal, that we finally not lose the things eternal. Through Grant this, Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen.
Convocation of Canterbury opened the day after Parliament in June 1536. Anne's head is off with a clear example of balance of power. Bishop Stokesley celebrated the Mass, but Bishop Latimer preached. To the despair of the papal sympathizers and the light of the Protestants, the English Reformation continued. Cranmer didn't fall with Anne Boleyn, and Cromwell actually gained power that summer. Anne's father surrendered the Lord Privy Seal to Cromwell in June, and Cromwell was made a peer of the realm. Though Cromwell worked for evangelical interests, Cromwell's power and intercessions on Cranmer's behalf came at a price. Cromwell needed income to keep his status as a peer. Beginning in July 1536, the king transferred several of the archbishop's traditional lands from Cranmer to Cromwell. For a millennium, the church had owned two-fifths of all the land in Kent, the archbishop holding the largest estate. It also possessed huge estates near London. In a series of acts over the next decade, the king swapped the archbishop's land for smaller estates. These property exchanges weakened the church while strengthening the crown. Unlike his financially astute predecessors, Cranmer had little experience in aggressive negotiations of self-protection against the king. Although he did do what he could to keep the lands for his successors of his position, he said, I am the man that hath small experience in such causes and have no mistrust at all in my prince on that behalf. He understood what was going on. We turn now to... Paul Aris is Thomas Cranmer, churchman and scholar, and a delightful article. Who was writing that on Cranmer and the Marriage Vows by Kenneth Stevenson? The preliminary consent is a literary translation of the Serum Missal. Apart from noting custodire is rendered comfort, the important assertion is after God's ordinance, which came from Luther's trial Buchen, which expresses the right wing of the Reformation's theology in, the, in an ordinance, not a sacrament. It is, the vow, it is in the vows that more intricate work surfaces. Clearly modeled on the serum, there are a number of significant alterations. First, to love and to cherish has been inserted between serum six and sickness and health. This picks up the theme of comfort from the preliminary consent. But an archbishop who married a Lutheran against his monarch's approval might be said to have made this addition deliberately to express the freedom that that in the Reformed Church, priests were not to solemnize marriage, but having some direct experience of it. Secondly, Cranmer replaces, if Holy Church will ordain, with the words, according to God's holy ordinance, balancing the insertion at the start of the preliminary consent. This is a clear indication, yet again, that marriage is an ordinance. It is neither purely a civil affair, as long Parliament was to enact a century later, nor a sacrament in the medieval Catholic sense of it. Thirdly, Cranmer follows York rather than Sarum in being reticent about the more colorful language, bonere buxum, and confining himself to obedience. This is consistent with Cranmer's reputation for restraint. Fourthly, and most mysteriously of all, Cranmer alters the final verb in a woman's vow from plight to give. So far, no satisfactory explanation has been offered. Indeed, it is passed over in silence. 
it could be that Cranmer is trying to be clever by introducing some literary variety, but there was none in the manuals. Could he really take the view that a man can plight, but a woman can only give? That would seem hardly inconceivable. With these four alterations, therefore, Cranmer's liturgical masterpiece was given to the English-speaking world. As luck would have it, the various exceptions to the prayer book marriage that subsequent generations of Puritan divines took were focused on the use of the ring, some of the language of the surface service, including the nuptial Eucharist itself. However, at the Savoy Conference, one concession was made to those who depart in the vow to be misused, and it was changed due part. This is what might be called standing the test of time. Before leaving Cranmer in the classical Anglican prayer books, it's worth paying attention to what are their plans and books in this area. And now for Jasper Ridley on Cranmer. Cranmer told Lessels not to repeat the story to anyone. This is about Catherine Hare Howard, and immediately communicated the information to Audley and Hereford. They decided to take no action until the king returned from the north. Audley and Hereford were afraid to tell the king, for Henry was passionately in love with Catherine, and they feared that he would vent his fury against the man who dared to accuse her of misconduct. They therefore suggested that Cranmer should inform Henry. And Cranmer, who was always ready to perform a painful duty, agreed to do so. Henry and Catherine reached Hampton Court on 29 October. But though Cranmer, Audley, and Hertford were also at Hampton Court, they kept their secret and said nothing for three days while they dealt in counsel with the report of the Commissioner of Sewers for Sussex and other routine questions. On All Saints Day, a mass of thanksgiving was held at Hampton Court for the safe return of the King from the North and the happy life which he was leading with his Queen. But Cranmer still remained silent. He seems to have been postponing the ordeal for as long as possible. But del further delay might be dangerous. He decided to write the information on paper rather than tell Henry to his face. And on All Souls Day, he slipped the paper into Henry's hand during the Mass for the Dead, which was being celebrated by Bishop Longland of Lincoln. And we'll pick up the story as we go on. Hi, Matthew. Catherine, good to see you again. And we finish that part of the story on Kate, Kate Catherine Howard, who's been a, a true adulteress to King Henry and Cranmer, writes it down on a piece of paper for Henry rather than face to face. And here we bring it to a close. God before us, who can be against us? Glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed.